Well, it is good to be with you. Again, I'm Joel, one of the pastors, and today is Easter Sunday, and that's exciting for us. I asked someone yesterday, I was like, you know what today is? They're like, yes, spring break week. I was like, no, Lord have mercy, it's Easter, and we get to celebrate something so powerful in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Why? Because we have in Jesus, we have in Jesus what the world desperately needs, which is hope. And so we get to talk about what that means for us today. Uh, I want to start with you uh, this morning by looking at Philippians, though. Yes, we're going to be in the Gospel of Matthew. We're concluding our Seek First series, walking in the last three weeks through the Gospel of Matthew. So for those of you who have done that, we'd love to hear from you. And if that was helpful and beneficial for you and ways that you could even change it, um, we're already evaluating now out of the responses, doing several more books like that for people. Um, but Philippians 3, 8 through 11 says, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as what? In order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes from through faith in Jesus Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Our prayer today is that you may know him and the power of his resurrection, not simply know about an event that we name Easter, Not that you simply know what church is, not simply that you know that there was this guy by the name of Jesus who seemed to be really cool. Our prayer today is that you would actually know who he is personally. I I want today to be an alarm for you, right? The the illustration I'll give is um, my kids sometimes, if you've ever had kids, they can struggle to wake up sometimes, yes? Yes. Um, if you've ever had a spouse, they can wake up, struggle to wake up sometimes, um, right? We, we're all that way. It depends on the day. And so I had one kid who actually tried a, a watch um, that vi- it, it, it sends an electrical current through your body until you wake up, until you get up and you have to do 10 jumping jacks until it stops. Can you imagine? Right? But some of us need that. And, and I always picture the, the kid still laying on the bed just trying to do this, trying to get it to stop, right? That's what, that's what I envision. Uh, the prayer today is that it would be a wake-up call for you. Right? Even, even if you're here uh, on Easter Sunday, let's be honest. If you're here at an 8 o'clock service, you have a special love from Jesus to you. Right? You remember the back in the day we had the Easter sunrise service? Yeah, no, no, not anymore. Um, Why? Because everybody was in their bed doing like this, right? Couldn't get up. And we we look at the significance of the day, and I am praying. I'm wanting today, right? Just hear this. This is your alarm. I'm wanting it to be an alarm for you. I want us to recognize we need to wake up. If you've been to this church before, you know the angst that I have, the spiritual angst that I have in our society today. We had so much with the church and was influencing so much. And to me, honestly, because of our apathy and our complacency, we gave it all away. But praise be to God in his power and his truth, he can still do whatever he pleases. But I'm asking that today you would consider waking up spiritually. We have the greatest reason there is to get out of bed and to live for a Savior. We have the greatest reason. And so some of us, even as professing believers, need to be shocked into spiritual vitality. Can you say spiritual vitality? So a little bit of a tongue twister there. Say it five times fast. Ready, set, go. No, don't. Um, We're going to be examining the difference between spiritual apathy today and spiritual vitality because I want us to give an opportunity for us to go, which one are we? Because everyone assumes, right, that we're the spiritual vitality guy. Oh, look at me. Whoop, whoop. Right? I'm doing great. Look at me. I'm doing this. I read, I read. Listen, I wanted to read the Bible through the year, made it all the way to January 3rd, 
right? We assume that we're that. But I want us to look at the word of God and I want us to examine where we are so that we don't just celebrate a, a past event in history, but we celebrate the actual power that, has a, that, that, that Jesus Christ has over our lives today. So here are some signs of spiritual apathy. I'm going to go through the apathy part pretty fast because I'd rather live in the spiritual vitality part. All right. So here are some signs of spiritual apathy. I'm just listing them all at once so you can see them there. One, if you can't dive into the word of God, if you're not reading the Bible, there's probably some spiritual apathy happening. Why? Because this is 100% the true word of God that he spoke to people to give, to record, to put down so that we could have it forever. And he gave it to us. And if you can't open the power of the word of God on a daily basis, it's, I get you may miss a day here or there. I get that. But I tell you what, that's a sign of apathy. It, it, it is what it is. Well, I don't have time to read the Word of God. Really, you, you don't have five minutes to get in the Word of God. Do you, know, it's, do you know the science has actually proven those who jump into the Word of God and spend prayer is something like seven to eight minutes a day that there's significant lower levels of stress and anxiety? And we still choose not to do it. Because we we'd rather complain our, about our anxiety than not have any sometimes. Right? The challenge I would have, we'd love to tell people how busy we are. Can we, I would like to challenge you for one week, not, do not say the words, I'm busy, one time. Because that was your choice, typically. You have the ability to say no. And so we have all of these things in our life, and we don't even make time for reading the Word of God. Another one is not praying. Pr- prayer shows your value that you have in God and also the value you place on self because sometimes if you can't pray, that means you think you can do it yourself. Not participating, and so you're not using. One of the values that we have here is that everybody would step into their area of spiritual giftedness. And so you're not using your gifts to serve the kingdom. You're not using your resources to give back and to be a part of what he's doing. Maybe not living victoriously over temptation and sin. And so you keep falling prey to the same temptation and the same sin in your life. And maybe that's lust or pornography or alcohol or drugs or whatever it is. And you keep going to that over and over. Maybe it's just technology. Right? Recently I was saying, right, the National Institute of Health said two hours should be your max on technology every day, but the average millennial today is nine hours. The average American is seven in front of a screen. That's a lot of time. And we know what it does to us. And we know that, that studies will tell you the longer you're in front of a screen, the more anxiety and stress that you have. And so maybe you're living in spiritual apathy if you're not living victoriously over that temptation, those sin, those things in your life. Other signs would be if you live in fear, if you live in defeat, if you live in selfishness, everything has become just about getting what you want to get no matter what. These are signs of apathy. Uh, maybe you've even heard the, the, the terminology familiarity breeds indifference. And you're just indifferent to certain things because you're so familiar with the, the, the Easter story that you're indifferent to the Easter story. Like you already know what to expect. You're going to come in here and you're going to get excited and you're going to, whoa, yeah, he lives, woo! But you're so accustomed to it, it actually doesn't mean anything to you. You're doing it just as much because the person beside you is doing it as it is because it's in your heart and it just wants to burst forth. And so we have to examine this. Right? We, we, can, we can have so much indifference in our life because of the familiarity of even coming to church. We have people getting agitated because they have to, they have to wait in the parking lot to get in to come worship a king. Right? Because we're, we, we're, it's not about coming to worship. We're familiar with it. We're so familiar with it that we can become bothered by others wanting to come to encounter a savior because they're in desperate need of a king. And so are you living in spiritual apathy or spiritual vitality? And the prayer is that you're not apathetic or numb to the resurrection and the life. So this is even Paul's prayer for the church in Ephesus. This is what it says in Ephesians 1, 19 through 20. It says, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards, toward us who believe according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ, that he worked in Christ 
when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places. Friends, the resurrected Christ is more than a historical event. It is the power and the life of the Christian that we are able to live by. And so we're praying today that we experience that. Otherwise, uh, talking about that wake up, wake up, Right? You heard it from uh, Pastor Eric mentioned it before when he was welcoming and then Pastor Munden there leading worship. And now I'm telling you again, part of the goal is for us to wake up today. We want to challenge you to wake up. It can be hard to wake up, I know. Spiritually speaking, it can be hard to wake up because if you want to wake up spiritually, it often will mean that you have to do things differently than you've been doing them. You can't expect to do what you've been doing and get different results. And so then you start to think about, well, maybe I need to change some things in my life. I'm going to maybe change when I go to sleep so I can wake up early. I'm going to change what I do in the evening. And those are hard things to do because we grow so accustomed to doing the same thing over and over again. But we're wanting you to do that because if not, you can become, well, actually you can become a sloth, right? We, we love that word here. It's seven deadly sins. It was about the fourth century that they, they really said, hey, here are seven deadly sins that we see. And it was some monks who did this. And Here's what they found out. Here's one of the seven deadly sins that they called out um, is that you are like a sloth. Being a sloth is spiritual or moral laziness. That's what it is. It's neglecting one's responsibility, failing to use God-given talents and gifts properly. Right? In, in Latin, the word sloth actually means without care. It means you no longer have care. You know about something, but you just kind of do your thing. You're like, okay, yeah, I get it. It's cool. It's nice. But now you're a sloth. You you don't have care. You're, You're without care when it comes to what Jesus Christ has actually done. This is when, when you're a sloth, it's when the days go by and we never really consider whether or not we're living in that day by the power of Jesus. Right? Expecting him to do the unexpected. And so, yeah, it's Easter, but we're wanting to challenge you. I am wanting to challenge you to wake up today if you already claim to know Jesus Christ and to start living with a greater spiritual vitality. And so in order to do that, we're going to look at uh, Matthew chapter 28, 1 through 10. Matthew chapter 28, 1 through 10. I want to read this for us right now. Will you go ahead? Let's stand up for the reading of the word of God. And I know what you're thinking. You're like, man, wait, I thought he was halfway through the message. That was just the intro. And I'm going to go, yep, here we go. Now, after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. Now, we already know that Jesus was placed in the tomb with Joseph of Arimathea. He, he donated that and said, hey, put Jesus here. And so now they're going to prepare his body. They're going to, to open up the tomb and prepare his body properly, as according to Jewish custom. That's what they're doing here. And so it says, behold, though. So here come these ladies, and they're going to go do their duty. And it's awesome to see these, I think, were tremendous women of faith. And it says, behold, there was a great earthquake for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, do not be afraid. For I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here for he is risen. As he said, come see the place where he lay. And then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshiped him. And then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. This is the word of God. You may be seated. This text is a picture of the spiritual life that comes from a risen Savior. 
right? You're literally about to see the journey that some of us need to make in our own life. They believe that Jesus is no longer living. And some of you are going, I don't know if he was ever alive to begin with, especially, yeah, I get it. He was a great prophet, but Messiah, son of God, not sure. And they're going to go on a journey. And now all of a sudden, by the end of it, they're going to recognize that even though there's fear and there are those times of being afraid that they just recognize that their savior lives and their lives changed. And maybe that's how you need to be woken up today. So I told you, I gave you some signs of spiritual apathy. When we look at this text, I think we see some signs of spiritual vitality. So hopefully you wrote down those signs of spiritual apathy. Let's write down some signs of spiritual vitality and what that means for our life and how we can move forward with it. One is that you have courage in place of fear. You're right. Well, why is it? Well, from verse six to verse 10, it says, do not fear. Do not be afraid four times. It says, we know that it says in the word of God that 365 times, I believe it's one for every day of the year. And so here we find it four times in this passage, either do not fear or do not be afraid. And these ladies, they come and they are, they're scared in this passage. You know that they've got to be like, what is going on? Remember, they're coming to fulfill their responsibilities. And as they're coming to fulfill their responsibilities, all of a sudden there's an earthquake. We see it so clearly, the fear that they could have had after the Sabbath. And we know it was after the Sabbath. Part of the thing is they wanted to make sure um, that they were going to crucify him before the Sabbath came. And so they expedited that entire thing. That's why Pilate, then to Herod, then back to Pilate. Pilate said, I find no fault in this guy, but whatever. Okay, I'll give you Barabbas. And so he cru- they, they crucify him. And they did it very quickly because they wanted to get it done before the Sabbath so it would stop messing up. Uh, the religious leaders especially wanted it done before Sabbath so it would stop messing up their events with Passover. The city was full of people, four to five times, right? It's normal size. And so with all the people coming, all the Jewish people coming in, they wanted to get it done. And now on the third day, Friday, Saturday, and on the third day, it says that Jesus would rise again. But they're coming in after the Sabbath because they couldn't do it on the Sabbath. They weren't allowed to go to prepare the body on the Sabbath. So they're coming on the third day. Isn't it amazing how God lines it all up perfectly? And so now here these ladies come and they're of all things like we have to go do this. And then of all times, there's an earthquake. There's just trauma everywhere. Remember, it was only a couple of days ago that the world went dark for three hours. And now here come these ladies who are wanting to prepare the body of Jesus. And it says that there is an earthquake Behold, there was a great earthquake for an angel of the Lord. So not only was there an earthquake, but an angel descends from heaven, rolls back this giant stone, would have been yay high, thousands of pounds. It would typically normally take three to four grown men to be able to eventually roll those stones back. Often using somewhat of a pry bar, if you want to call it that, to help get it going. And so now here come these two ladies. I don't even know. How are they going to expect to move this? I, I don't know. And it tells us that there's an earthquake, an angel descends, rolls back the stone. I'm sure at this point the ladies are like, hey, thanks for doing our work for us. I don't know. Angel sits on the stone and be like, there it is. His appearance like lightning, his clothes white as snow. And then it goes to the guards. You have the guards, you have the women, you have the disciples. You, of course, have Jesus here in this passage. It's really remarkable because then you have the guards. Now, they wanted to get him crucified before the Sabbath. They, he rises from the dead, of course. We know that this is what is prophesied um, and spoken about over and over and over again. And they were nervous about his body being stolen. So what we find here in verse 4 is that the guards are now present. And you know that they sent their best. Hey, guys, this, guy, uh, this, this person named Jesus has really created a fuss and created a lot of problems and a lot of headaches for all of us, for all the religious leaders, but also for the Roman officials. And we're done with this guy. And they're saying that he's going to rise from the dead. And he even said that he's going to destroy the temple. Remember this one? Hey, I'm going to destroy the temple in three days. I'm going to build it back and it's going to rise. And they're thinking literally, not physically with his body, of course. And so... I, Already, this is happening. When this is happening, the Roman Empire isn't sending, um, hey, who are, your, who are your worst guards that you have? Send them. I assure you what they're doing is saying, whoever's the best, make sure they go and attend to this because we cannot have this mess up. 
We cannot deal with this nonsense they are thinking anymore. So they send their guards. And here's the response of the guards when they see all this. The women, they show up. Earthquake, angel, stone rolled back. Angel sitting there like, like, in this bright white clothing. Like, just here it is. And they're like, they're, they're fearful, but they're doing their thing. Here, here's what the guards do. It says, the guards trembled and became like dead men. They became like corpses. That's what it is. They became useless. So they become useless, and the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who is crucified. Now, something we will often speak about is just when when you look at these guards and you look at these women, friends, courage doesn't mean you don't have fear. Courage means you're willing to still step into something regardless of the fear. And so they had courage in place of fear. They, it doesn't mean that the fear was no more. Otherwise, you wouldn't have do not be afraid and do not fear so often. But they were willing to step into it and still embrace what God was doing. But some of you are allowing fear to rule the day. Why, but, but if I really give my life to Jesus, if I do what I want to do, what are my friends going to think? Some of you are going, if I give my life to Jesus, what are my parents going to think? Because they don't even want me to be at church. That's a common story here. And so you're going, how am I going to move beyond wherever I am currently and move from that place of spiritual apathy to spiritual vitality? And part of it is moving beyond the fear that you might have in your life and trusting God in it. I'm not saying it's going to be easy. I assure you that what these women were experiencing was not easy. Romans eight fourteen and 15 says, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. You you, you didn't receive or give him authority. That's another way to, to think about this. You didn't give Jesus all this authority, acknowledging what he did on the cross, acknowledging what he did in in leaving the tomb empty, so that you can still live according to the fear in your life. But you have received the spirit of adoption. As sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. And you can trust in him and still live into the courage, not the fear. This is part of waking up and living with spiritual vitality. Not only that, but we are not, we're, we're not only we to live with courage in place of fear, another sign of spiritual vitality is that we have victory in place of defeat. Victory in place of defeat. Victory in place of defeat, right? The the women came thinking that all had been lost, and now they are going to soon discover that everything was actually gained. Maybe you stepped into this place today going, okay, I'm here. I know it's early, but I can just get it out of the way. I'm done. My my family's going to be pleased. I, I got it out of the way. Look at me. Woo, I'm awesome. And yet you truly need to step more into understanding a place of victory. Maybe you came today thinking everything was already lost and your life is miserable, but maybe you could find something much greater today. In verses 6 through 8, and this is after they, this angel says, I know that you seek Jesus and I pray that you're seeking Jesus and nothing else in your life. I pray. If somebody knows who, who you are, let me just say this real quick. If you go to your closest friends or closest family members and you go, hey, look at my life. What do you think I seek more than anything else? Just see what they say. Give them full permission. Go up to them and say, hey, when you look at my conduct, the decisions that I make, how I spend my energy, how I spend my time, how I spend my resources, what do you think I seek more than anything else? And just see what they say. So the angel is saying, hey, I know that you seek Jesus who is crucified. He's not here for he is risen. As he said he would, come see the place where he lay. Like making that journey. He's not here. They're standing there. Angels on the stone. The, the, the angel says, hey, he's not here. He's risen. You want to come see where just, he said he was going to do this. Like the angel's probably acting like, hey, he already said it. Don't you know? Do you want to come see where he lay? Come on. Now making that journey. 
Friends, every historian, everybody believes that Jesus was there and he was crucified. Everybody knows this. It's a matter of whether or not some would say, oh, there's no way he could physically rise from the dead, not understanding that he is the son of God. So are you willing to go from, oh, wait, I just heard he is risen. We just came and said he is risen. Everybody say he is risen. But are you willing to move from the he is risen to God? I'm going to go see it and place my faith in the fact that the tomb is now empty. Do you see the journey? And maybe you need to take that journey of spiritual apathy to spiritual uh, vitality in your own life. Because you're speaking and you're like, oh yeah, he is risen. But you actually haven't come to see the tomb is empty. To live in that type of victory rather than just simply standing there. If they would have just stayed standing there, they would have lived in defeat. If they would have been like the guards who fell and became like corpses, dead men, they would have been living in defeat. They would have heard the good news, but they would have done nothing with it. Are you hearing the good news and doing what you need to do with it? So yeah, if a sign of spiritual vitality, courage in place of fear, victory in place of defeat, third one, joy in place of apathy. Joy in place of apathy. Now, everybody knows I'm big on this because the number of times that David wrote in the Psalms about the joy of the Lord, right? And then when I see other people writing like Paul, consider it pure joy, my brothers, when you face trials of many kinds. And you just see it throughout scripture. And I, I, grew, up in, I grew up in some churches way down south, right? Um, where it's just like people knew the ritual, but they lived in such apathy at times. Not everybody, of course, but so many people, I felt like they lived with such apathy and there was no joy oozing out of them. Friends, I'm in ministry because the joy of the Lord took hold of my heart. Right? Even when I, st- and, and again, I know some of you already know this, but even when I started in business, I, the reason I stepped in and it's like, okay, I, I got a business degree. I'm working for this big company and I'm doing my thing. And then I recognized no matter who I was around, I kept telling them about Jesus because Jesus took hold of my heart. I was like, well, I might as well go to seminary. It's not much different than that. My, I think my mom was praying, please don't be a pastor. And so there's a joy in place of apathy, and we see this. Uh, look at verse 9 and 10. Uh, here, here it comes. So ver- verse 8 and 9, let's do that. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy. So th- what a juxtaposition. Fear and what? Great joy. Well, I, th- I think we sometimes... Um, had this idea that if we love Jesus Christ and yeah, we've surrendered to him, we're going to have nothing but joy. No, you can have joy in the place in, in the midst of still going, this is scary, but I'm, I'm doing it. Right. It feels like you're going to fall off, but I'm doing it because you trust in the savior so much that, you know, regardless, as long as you're trying to trust in him, that you can have this joy that is radiating, pulsing out of your life. And again, it doesn't mean there aren't days of heart and sorrow, that there aren't days of fear and going, I, all right. The women, they end up in this passage, it says they had great joy and they ran to tell the disciples and behold, Jesus met them. They're running to tell the disciples and they meet Jesus along the way. And Jesus is first, he's like, greetings, what's up? Que pasa? (laughs) And their response is they grab his feet, fall down and worship him. That's another sign of spiritual vitality. Yes, I'm going to say it again. Courage in place of fear, victory in place of defeat, joy in the place of apathy, but also worship in place of doubt. 
Worship in place of doubt. Like, is that, are these signs, I'm ho- hopefully you're starting to pick up, or are one of these four signs, is that how you're living? And does that show you that you're living with a spiritual vitality in your own life? Because there's worship in place of doubt. The women, they, they find that Jesus, they go to where the angel's like, hey, why don't you come see where he was? He's not here. See, I told you. And so now it tells us that they're running, they're going before to tell the disciples. But then Jesus is there, it says, greetings. And they see Jesus, they came up, they took hold of his feet. Now, if they take hold of his feet, you know that they're bowing down, they're worshiping him. They're bowing down because they've taken his feet, right? And they worshiped him. I I love to worship. Our family loves to worship there's a reason I have a sound system because it's like, man, I, it just, it calibrates us sometimes, doesn't it? Really rough day, really rough time, or maybe you're just living a life and you're just exhausted. Sometimes I, I, I run at a pace that I, it's probably, I don't, I don't even know if it's God honoring. And, and I recognize that because it's going too fast and um, so sometimes I'll just look up praise songs. I'll try to find worship songs. Nothing about strength in the Lord. This is, that's all it's about. Just strength in the Lord, strength in the Lord, strength in the Lord, strength in the Lord, strength in the Lord. And all of a sudden I find myself stopping long enough to allow my life to be still living for him and not for self. Like this is a, it's a sign of spiritual vitality. It doesn't mean that things aren't hard. They get hard. But what you do in that moment, you're making a choice of whether or not you want to live with spiritual vitality. Some of us need to live with some spiritual vitality. And you're going, no, oh, but I know Jesus. But do you really? Did you hear that for your whole life? Have you just heard he is risen? And so your parents taught you to say he is risen, but yet you've never walked over to go, it is empty. The tomb's empty. Woo! That spiritual vitality go, and it's going to be hard, and I'm going to still have fear in my life, but I am going to worship even on the days of doubt because I know that there is a Savior. I know that there is a King. I know that there is a Lord. I know that there is a God. I know that there is a purpose. I know that there is hope, and that hope is named Jesus. That's a spiritual vitality. I'm, I'm, I'm inviting you to wake up today. Are you living in spiritual apathy or spiritual vitality? That's the question, right? I mean, it's the theme, spiritual apathy, spiritual vitality. And how, I'm trying to let you know, how do you know if you're living? Because some, everybody claims one of those. Are you accurate in what you claim? <laughs> right? That's why I, I love how many people are even being baptized here. We baptize far more adults than we do children. I love that. People going, you know what? I'm in. Let's go. In fact, in the back, right, I wish we could turn it around. That wall right there has hundreds and hundreds of, there it is. That's so cool. Um, Hundreds of names of people who have been baptized right here. And maybe that's a step that you need to take in terms of spiritual vitality. I mean, I will will baptize you in this service today. We'll baptize you in the next one or the next one or the next one. We don't care. If you want to come back at four o'clock, I'll have somebody at four o'clock here. Won't be me, but I'll have somebody here. (laughs) Friends, new discovery. Here's the thing. When these, these ladies are like, what did we just discover? New discovery can lead to a place of fear. But it can also lead to a place of greater faith. Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Friends, claiming, living with spiritual vitality isn't trying to do better. It's simply surrendering your life to him. You can't earn it, remember? You can't be good enough. I have have four remarkable kids. I adore them. 
and they are well-behaved, but I'm not trying to make sure they're well-behaved. I'm trying to make sure they're in love with Jesus. And sometimes we can confuse the two. What is the alarm that's needed in your life? What's going to make you spiritually get up out of bed and start doing your jumping jack so that the alarm actually turns off? And God's going to use something in your life to help you. And you're going to either reject that or receive that. 2 Corinthians Corinthians 7.10, that God God says he can even use, he even uses the sorrows of our life to help us turn away from sin and to draw closer to him. He's going to use something to do it. Uh, Matthew 24, verse 42 says, stay awake. You don't know what day the Lord is coming. So wake up. How sad would it be to be in a spiritual slumber when the Lord returns? Are you living in spiritual apathy or spiritual vitality? I I want to finish with just this passage. This is Romans chapter 6. And this is the challenge because I'm praying that you guys, somebody would wake up today spiritually. So if if you're all like, Pastor, you don't understand, man. I'm alive and well. Let's go. Super. But now you have some tools talking about spiritual apathy and spiritual vitality to take to somebody else and go, here's what we find in Scripture. Here are some signs that we have. But some of you need to go, it's time. Today needs to set a new day. Like it's a new beginning. And this is what we find in Romans 6, verse 3 and following. And I just feel like it's appropriate to stand for this. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized in Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For we have been united with him. We know that our old self was crucified with him. Our old self, spiritual apathy, don't really care, but I know the right things to say. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. Because we have now died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, verse 9, we know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. And death no longer needs to have dominion over you. Jesus will return And we have an opportunity to live eternally with him. To live with the spiritual vitality. Will you wake up? Praise be to God. Lord, I come before you. I pray for these brothers and sisters. I pray that the ones who aren't my spiritual brothers and sisters will become my spiritual brothers and sisters, that they would just catch a glimpse of you, that they would hear, he is risen, and they would go, yeah, I want to go see if the tomb's empty for myself, and that they would discover it to be true that they would discover it to be true. And so God, give us that courage in place of fear. Give us that joy even when fear is present. May we worship even when there is doubt because we worship a king that is forever. In Christ's name, amen.